So we just received uh, some reports a moment ago that James Clapper, the DNI, the Director of National Intelligence, who has served that role in President Obama's administration, announced in this open hearing, according to these reports, that he submitted his resignation last night. He said, I have 64 days left in this office. Um, he expressed a sense of, of relief, perhaps, that he was ready to move on. There's no doubt that there will be lots of resignations of this nature to follow because pretty much uh, Donald Trump, the president-elect, will begin with a clean slate. But he has had a difficult tenure at times, uh, the DNI, James Clapper, and he has announced this morning, according to these reports, that he is indeed moving on. So more reaction to that as we go through here. In the meanwhile, a steady stream of high-profile visitors. There are cameras that are just set up watching everybody go through Trump Tower because it's a veritable parade of potential cabinet picks and administrators who may be part of the Trump administration. Lots of people vying for certain spots out there and not a lot on exactly who will get them. A big day also on Capitol Hill for the vice president elect as Mike Pence has meetings there that are set up throughout the day with Senate and House leaders from both parties as he begins to play what will be a very pivotal role for Mike Pence in terms of getting through legislation on tax reform, on Obamacare. All of that is really at the top of the list from what we've heard from the Trump administration so far, uh, or the transition team. So we welcome you now to hour two of America's Newsroom. I'm Martha McCallum. And I'm Bill Hemmer. Good morning. The Trump team is screening candidates with an eye toward finding the right people to carry out the vision of Donald Trump. Senior advisor Kellyanne Conway with us last hour right here, describing how the effort is going both here in New York and at the official transition offices in Washington, D.C. when she said this. Obviously a ton of work to do, but we're doing it methodically and very calmly. And uh, the president-elect has slid into this role amazingly well because he's a transactional guy. He's somebody who's used to re reviewing information, getting many different inputs, getting the advice of many different counselors, and then making his decision. So if you look back at history, Presidents Reagan, Clinton, Bush 43, waiting six weeks before making their first cabinet picks, and President-elect Obama making a single appointment in week three. Uh, he finished in late December of 2008. Yeah, we're just a little over a weekend, um, so it would actually be uh, somewhat unusual to be making too many picks at this stage of the game, even though there's a lot of discussion about what's taking so long. So Brett Baer joins us now, anchor of Special Report. Brett, uh, good morning to you. Good to see you this morning. Um, good morning. I want to start by getting a reaction to this news that uh, the director of the DNI has resigned in that hearing this morning. Your thoughts? Yeah, I think expected. I think, as you said, there will be a lot of resignations that we hear about um, very quickly. Uh, this hearing is an opportunity basically for his swan song up on Capitol Hill. As you rightly point out, he's had a tough run in some of those hearings, um, saying uh, things that he didn't mean to say and had to clean up later. Uh, but. But Clapper uh, is somebody who uh, has dedicated himself, obviously, to this to this job. As you look at that hearing on Capitol Hill, the chairman of that hearing uh, in the House Intelligence Committee is Devin Nunes. Uh, he is going to be a guest on Special Report tonight, and we'll talk about, there he is right there, uh, we'll talk about all of the uh, issues with intelligence and the incoming Trump administration, and perhaps uh, some of the key spots yeah. that may be coming down the pike very soon. I mean, it's such a pivotal role. It was a role that was created after September 11th to get all of these agencies to talk to each other uh, and we know that there are investigations into potential Islamic terrorist attacks in every, almost every state in this nation so um, he has a very central role and whoever takes on that job is going to have a full plate um, ahead of them as well. Uh, so in terms of what we're hearing uh, about the transition and the process Brett and we watch more and more people come in Nikki Haley's name thrown into the mix uh, late yesterday as well. Uh, what's your take from where you sit in Washington? Well, listen, this is a dangerous time just because people are throwing out names and just seeing if they stick on the wall. I mean, that's that's where the process is as far as reporting on it. There's very little uh, nailing down actual decisions until they're announced. So um, it, it's the fun parlor game in Washington, but it's a little bit frustrating to get to the person. I, I think there are a few people, Martha, in the potential administration who have uh, a choice. They were early in on the Trump campaign. 
campaign, for example, Jeff Sessions. Uh, he's named for a couple of possible positions because uh, I think the deference is uh, to his choice because he was in so early with, uh, with Mr. Trump on his campaign. Uh, I do think that they're going through some vetting and it is a two-way street, remember. It is the offer of the job, but that person has to look at the paperwork, look at all that's entailed in this job and say, okay, I'm in. Yeah. Uh, some people get there quicker than others. And there's also some feedback from Capitol Hill about how difficult or how easy certain people's confirmation process might be, right? Well, exactly. And, you know, you get some of these guys on Wall Street, for example, uh, some of their background is very complicated and it's uh, and there are potential minefields out there. Uh, so, you know, one of the reasons a lot of people talk about that we don't have the best uh, in government is because the process is pretty <laughs> complex That's for sure. to go through the paperwork and to go through the hearing um, to put your life out there in front of everybody. Yeah, we, we talked to John Sununu yesterday and he said that his message, he said, you know, I'm not asked, but if I were asked, I would tell them to slow down. And when you look at that chart that we put up in the beginning of our introduction to you, Brett, you know, people do take their time. Uh, you look at Ronald Reagan, who made the decision in week six we are barely yeah. in the second week of this process but there's all this focus on you know oh it's all chaotic and Donald Trump you know comes from the outside so he must not know what he's doing um, but you know we got I mean, that chart a, up again it really shows a that close people do look at time. that chart you know I mean look President Obama the first pick uh, nearly three weeks it was in week three uh, but then as you rightly point out Ronald Reagan Jimmy Carter uh, it takes a long time Bush 43 is a little different because he started late with the recount yeah uh, uh, but his process really started right after the election, if you remember, Dick Cheney running that process, eventually becoming um, the person uh, who, who ran a lot yeah. in that administration. But I, I think if you look at that chart and then you look at the headlines, there is a real disconnect. Uh, and one week and one day, as of yesterday, um, you could give them a little breathing space. Yeah, they're big decisions, uh, and there's a good reason to take your time. Now that we've got all of America looking for their reading glasses to take a look at that yeah. chart. Um, <laughs> <I know. laughs> Brett, thank you so much. We'll see you later. All right. Have a good one. If it's you three too. weeks, there's going to be a lot of elevator rides over there. A lot of <laughs> elevator <laughs> rides. Know. Uh, so the Vice President-elect Mike Pence arriving last hour in Capitol Hill. We watched that about 30 minutes ago, laying the groundwork for what he hopes is a productive relationship with Congress. We might hear from him this hour, in fact, but first, here's Mike Emanuel. We hear from him first, live from the Russell Rotunda on the Hill. Mike, good morning. What's happening? Well, Bill, good morning to you. It's worth noting that Vice President-elect Mike Pence spent 12 years on Capitol Hill uh, in the House of Representatives before becoming Indiana governor. So Pence does not need a map to get around the halls of Congress. He also doesn't need a whole lot of name tags after serving as the former chair of the House Republican Conference. The Vice President-elect has relationships here on the Hill dating back 16 years and is the obvious bridge from a new administration to getting things done in Congress. The Trump administration has big items on its early agenda, including an infrastructure package, rebuilding highways, bridges, and upgrading our airports, for example, uh, tax reform, repealing and replacing Obamacare, and confirming a Supreme Court nominee. All will require close coordination between a new White House team and leaders here on Capitol Hill. Bill? What about dealing with Democrats? Mike, uh, give us a lay of the land about what you're, what you're picking up on that. Well, the vice president-elect certainly has relationships with them. He will sit down with them as well. Chuck Schumer will be the new minority leader in the new Congress, taking over after Harry Reid retires. He has relationships with President-elect Trump as both being New Yorkers. He is due to sit down with the vice president-elect at 2.15 this afternoon. After serving in the House, Pence and Democratic leader Nancy Pelosi certainly know one another. Pence and Pelosi are expected to meet around 1.45 this afternoon. In one area we're hearing a lot of interest from Democrats is the president-elect's package on infrastructure. That may be an early area of common interest. Bill? You know, Mike, when this vote was delayed, uh, for folks on the outside who don't follow day-by-day -day operations on the Hill, what does that suggest within the party itself? 
basically that they're allowing time, that there is definitely some discomfort with Nancy Pelosi as being the leader. Some saying, you know, this guard on the Democratic House side has been in power for a long time. Perhaps it's time for new leadership, a new vision, new energy. And there have been a lot of rank and file members who've been waiting their turn patiently, waiting for this old guard to move on. And so uh, she's got two more weeks basically to keep a revolt down. Uh, she says she's got a lot of support. We'll see in two weeks. That we will. Thank you, Mike. Mike Emanuel there in the Hill. Sure. Thank you. Talk to you later, Mike. Eight minutes past. So some breaking news that we're keeping a close eye on here. Director of National Intelligence Jim Clapper is being questioned in this hearing uh, and told them that he turned in his resignation and that it felt, quote, pretty good, he said, uh, as he gets ready to roll on in 64 days. And the consideration is underway for who will replace him as the head of the Director of National Intelligence. It is a very important job that coordinates all the agencies, and there are many, that do intelligence for our country. So we're keeping an eye on that. And speaking of the transition, is it going smoothly? or is it chaotic? That is the big question as we hear of the factions that may be at work trying to sort through the many, many names that want to serve in the Trump administration. It's a big job and they will be uh, taking some time to get it done, but we may get some names before the show is over. So we will let you know. We'll be right back. We are hearing from Europe, Eastern Europe. Police say they prevent a dual terror attacks plotted by ISIS. Groups in three countries said to be coordinating attacks on specific targets, reportedly planning to strike on Saturday in Kosovo, while simultaneously attacking the Israeli national soccer team in neighboring Albania. Earlier this month, 19 people detained in Kosovo, six more in Albania and Macedonia. Kosovo police say they found explosive devices and weapons in some of the homes of the suspects. I think the, the, the coverage is slightly over the top. In fact, it's uh, remarkably over the top. Historically, there's nothing unusual about not having made an announcement after one week and one day. Second, uh, the Trump campaign has been described as in disarray since about January, and he won the election. Get ready for more of that. Dr. Charles Krauthammer calling media coverage of trouble inside the Trump transition team overblown. Reports now surfacing of infighting as Mr. Trump tries to decide on key positions for his cabinet. The New York Times this week catching our attention with the following headline. Quote, firings and discord put Trump transition team in a state of disarray. Howard Kurtz is a Fox News media analyst and host of Media Buzz. Howard, good to have you with us today. Um, I think a lot of that came from the from the Christie stuff. Right. The fact that, you know, he was pushed aside and a couple of his people were also pushed aside. And, and that's where you got a lot of that. Krauthammer was being restrained slightly over the top. It is just remarkably overblown, Martha, because all transitions are messy. There's jockeying for power. There's That's people sure. who are not getting the jobs that they want. This one may be a little messier than usual because Donald Trump, not having been a politician, doesn't have a whole government in exile waiting to take over. But I think you Which really see... Which is probably part of the reason that people wanted him to take over. Right. And in January, nobody's going to care how long it took to name the cabinet. So but true. But I do think there is an underlying tone here of negativity in a lot of news organizations that seem to almost be saying, well, we told you so, this guy wasn't really ready for prime time. Yeah, I, I mean, it's, it's a complicated process because you do have people who've been loyal and you want to reward them, but you have to find the right person for each position. And that's the overriding importance that they have to grapple with here. Yeah, there's also sort of the age old tactic of floating certain names, seeing Absolutely. what the reaction is. So suddenly we're hearing, oh, it's going to be Rudy, Rudy for Secretary of State. No, it's going to be John Bolton, somebody yep. else. But that also gives the press targets to shoot at uh, and so you know we see a lot of stories about Everybody's well this guy have something to write about right so i mean that, that that's well, part that's of what's going the on big story right now yeah. um you know i do want to talk to you about this issue of the presidential press pool because we saw the moment the other night when uh Donald Trump decided to go out for dinner, like he, I'm sure, has always done with his family. They hopped in their cars and went around, but they had already put a lid on the press for the evening. So explain to those who might not have had that sink in, what's going on here? Well, first of all, Martha, there's a collective press freak out over the fact that Donald sure Trump was. took his wife to the 21 Club. Uh, and I think most people would say, well, he doesn't need nosy reporters trailing him. But there actually is an important principle here, and that is the reason there is what's called a protective pool for the future leader of the free world and for actual presidents once they're sworn in is a, a body wash that something might happen, something unfortunate might happen. We saw that with Ronald Reagan in 1981. We saw that on 9-11 with George Bush. You want to have the press there, not to intrude, but 
all new presidents have a trouble uh, um, adjusting to this loss of privacy. Barack Obama, by the way, yeah. slipped his protective pool in Hawaii eight years ago. There wasn't a big I remember that. calamity yeah. about that. I, I mean, you can see why they want to do it. They want a moment of just feeling normal and feeling like a regular person, mm -hmm. which I think everybody can relate to. Um, but this is the side from the National Press Club. We call on you to commit, this is to, to uh, President-elect Donald Trump, a protective press pool from now until the final day of your presidency. We respectfully ask you to instill a spirit of openness and transparency in your administration in many ways, but first and foremost via the press pool. A great America depends upon having sunlight on its leaders. We expect the, transi the traditions of the White House press coverage to be upheld, whether in Washington or elsewhere. I'm thinking it's going to be an interesting correspondence dinner already. <laughs> what do you think, Howie? <laughs> well, given the contentious relationship, look, yeah. President-elect Trump should commit to a protective press pool. You but believe he will? I believe he will. Yeah. His staff is sending signals that we just have Absolutely. to kind of get it together. And so the notion that he's not going to and he's going to shut the press out. I mean, if he does all that, I'll be on the show to criticize him. But I think, you know, we shouldn't go crazy over one dinner at the 21 Club. Yeah, I think they've sent signals that they intend to do just that. And you can understand the press corps pressing their opinion on it as well and wanting to make sure that that happens. Worst job is being a pool reporter now and sitting around Trump Tower for hours and hours. <laughs> There's somebody going into the elevator and you don't get anything out of them. Crazy, right? Oh, my gosh. All right, Howie, we'll be watching it all with you with great interest. Always great to have you here. Thanks, Thank you Martha. so much. Well, from New York down to Washington, Mike Pence is there today. He's in meetings right now. We may hear from him this hour, meeting with leaders on both parties, first Republicans, then Democrats. So trying to lay the groundwork for cooperation from day one between the White House and Congress. You know, those first 100 days are so critical. We'll see what uh, Mike Pence has to say a bit later today. Also, firefighters all around the country heading to the southeast to fight these fires. Seven different states now affected, and residents there are hoping, they are hoping for a break. It's all in the Lord's hands now. The rain will come when it comes. The real rain. The real rain. Breaking news right now, the Director of National Intelligence, the DNI, announced his resignation moments ago. That is James Clapper. He will be leaving his position. In fact, right now, Clapper is testifying before this House Intelligence Committee. It's underway right now. Uh, Leland Vitter tracking all the movement down now from D.C. Leland, what are you picking up? Good morning. Well, good morning to you, Bill. More of a formality, really, in terms of this resignation than a surprise. We had known that Director Clapper was on his way out at the end of the administration. He'd often talked about the fact that he only had X number of days or months left in office. You see him testifying right now in what you could probably consider to be an exit interview, if you will. And the big question here is exactly how open, how forceful will the Director of National Intelligence be? Few things here. Congressional Republicans say they won't let go of the Clinton email scandal despite the election results. And on the other side, the Democrats don't want to seem to let go the Russian involvement in hacking before the U.S. election. A number of top intelligence officials, including Mr. Clapper, implicated Russian hackers possibly acting on Moscow's orders in the DNC hack and maybe the WikiLeaks emails as well. Any proof of Russian involvement could have a big impact on the Trump administration, perhaps forcing Mr. Trump, who has already talked to Vladimir Putin, to respond to such evidence. Next comes the issues of Clinton's emails themselves, something the Republicans are going to ask about. There are still a lot of questions about the server and if it was compromised by foreign intelligence services. Clapper could offer a lot of details on that, along with questions about why there wasn't a formal damage assessment done about the possibility that Clinton's emails were compromised after being improperly stored. Other topics that could come up, and it is as wide as the world when it comes to intelligence matters, but this is what we're watching for, the status of the Taliban Five, and those were the worst of the worst, who the Obama administration traded for Army deserter Bo Bergdahl video of his trade right there. The last possibility is questions about the Trump transition, specifically who gets access to the most sensitive of government secrets when it comes to the presidential daily brief, those kinds of things. So far, really, the only thing that's come out of this hearing thus far, Bill, is the director saying it feels pretty good to only have 64 days left as the nation's director of national intelligence, and then he can sleep in like so many other folks who are leaving the administration here in Washington. Long road. <laughs> Thank yeah. you. Leland Vitter there in Washington, D.C. More headlines. Thank you, Leland.
I want to get you to this breaking news now. Dozens of wildfires are still scorching parts of the southeast. The region is parched by extreme drought. Dry autumn leaves are now actually fueling those flames. Fires burning across seven southern states. Thousands of firefighters from outside the region have flocked there to help the uh, local firefighters there on the ground. Jonathan Sari is live in Clayton, Georgia, with this story for us. Good morning to you, Jonathan. Hi, Martha. Yeah, more than 5,000, more than 5,000 firefighters and support personnel involved in this effort, many of them with extensive experience battling those massive blazes that you're used to seeing out west. But what's going on here is really an entirely different beast, and that's because of the fall leaves that normally draw tourists to the southern Appalachians this time of year, make it difficult for crews to contain the fires. Listen. We can put in a hand line and a, and a line that's going to stop the fire, but instead of leaving that like we normally would say in the West because it's secured, we got to leave somebody there to patrol it because leaves are constantly coming down and that fuel bed is now covering our line and then there's a, a fuel source to get across to the other side. In addition to thousands of firefighters on the ground, two dozen helicopters are scooping water from mountain lakes to pour on the flames. A cold front is ex expected to come in over the weekend, bringing more dry air and wind gusts of up to 50 miles an hour. And that could spread the flames even further. In many places, firefighters are expecting to remain on the job through mid-December. And because of the dry conditions, Martha, the National Park Service is imposing a ban on campfires along much of the southern Appalachian Trail. Back to you. All right, Jonathan, thank you. Another alert right now. Vice President-elect Mike Pence meeting right now with House Republicans on the Hill in a moment. He'll also talk to the House Speaker, Paul Ryan. Then he meets with Democrats. And so we'll tell you about the movements there, what's happening in D.C. Also in a moment, a congressional selfie to end all congressional selfies. How many more people How can many you more get in there? How many more were there? I, I, I mean, <laughs> not many. Uh, we'll talk to one of the lawmakers in that picture. Can you find him? That's the question. That's so funny. First, though, here's Ted Cruz and the work ahead for everyone in America. We are going to, I believe, repeal Obamacare, and we are going to confirm strong conservative Supreme Court justices to protect the Constitution and Bill of Rights. And, and if Democrats think they can stand in the way on that, I think they're sorely mistaken. We're waiting on this. In a moment ago during the commercial break, the vice president-elect Mike Pence moving from meeting to meeting was stopped by reporters because that's what we do. And... Uh, so he took a few questions. Just drop in on this from a moment ago. Republican colleagues, Governor Pence. Very humbling to be back uh, among my former colleagues. We're excited about moving the Trump agenda forward in the coming Congress, and I'm just so grateful. You talked so about grateful for the warm hospitality and all of their determination to work with our incoming administration to make America great again. You, you talked about a little bit about immigration. Uh, do you need a room? What's it going to mean for the incoming Trump administration? It's, uh, it's, it's very humbling. To be back in the room, I spent 12 years as a Congress senator. I've to be there with members I served with, with many men and women who have been elected to Congress since then, and to see the enthusiasm for the president elect's agenda for this country. Uh, I'm just very confident, on that, that, agenda? Very confident that as we move toward inauguration and bring together a great team, work in concert with leaders in the House and the Senate, uh, we're going to move an agenda that's going to rebuild our military, revive uh, our economy, uh, and uh, in a word, make America great. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Kristen, there you had Governor Mike Pence, the Vice President elect of this. So from there, we believe he meets with the House Speaker Paul Ryan. He'll also meet with Democrats today. And so we will track his every movement. In the meantime, Adam Kinzinger, lawmaker out of Illinois, with me now. And sir, good morning to you, and thanks for coming back here on America's Newsroom. A couple of specific things that are coming out of Trump Tower. I want to ask you about them. What is the effect on a worker within the Trump administration who signs that pledge about not being a lobbyist for five years. How's that going to go over in Washington? Just start there. It'll be hard to tell. I mean, we just, you know, obviously in his campaign, he was talking about this. And, uh, you know, there are going to be some folks probably that are looking at, okay, what's my life after an administration? And, of course, naturally, a lot of people that are involved in administration or politics will find themselves in lobbying or consulting. So I'm not sure if it's going to thin out the talent pool or not. But, it, look, it's a pledge that Donald Trump made. And I, I think the American people are looking at it that and saying that's the kind of change that we wanted. That's part of the drain the swamp, make America a great again theme so it's uh, like living by example yeah, will there be speaking of example will there be a ban on earmarks out of this congress 
Well, yeah, I mean, there is now. Um, we had a really good discussion yesterday as a conference. Part of the problem is, you know, earmarks used to be extremely abused. They would go to private companies, private organizations, and it would spend way over the amount that was allocated by Congress. But what actually happened is when you, when you go to a full ban, you actually give the power of where that money is spent to faceless bureaucrats in Washington, D.C. So what we came to an agreement on is part of clawing back Congress's power uh, out here, you know, for the American people, we have to discuss how to get back to where we can actually direct spending without abusing it in the full light of day and without adding a single penny to what would have been spent already. But this will be a conversation that we're committed to having in the light of the day in okay. front of the American people. Uh, a broad picture now. Ted Cruz two hours ago on Fox and Friends said the following. But I think on the Republican side, we need to demonstrate resolve. We need to demonstrate the seriousness to deliver on these promises. I can tell you this. We are going to, I believe, repeal Obamacare. And we are going to confirm strong conservative Supreme Court justices to protect the Constitution and Bill of Rights. Oh. Any disagreement there? No disagreement whatsoever. We, uh, in fact, when Vice President Mike Pence was talking to us today, when we were meeting before he came in, talking about the way forward, uh, we have a very robust first 100, first 200 day plan. Uh, we've got a way to get repeal of Obamacare through and some other really big things, including making taxes freer and fairer and flatter for everybody, uh, and really reviving this economy like President Mike Trump promised. So, uh, and, and we've got ways to do it. Even with the 60 vote threshold in the Senate, we've We've got ways to, to work this. So I'm actually really excited. The team's united. And, uh, and I think the American people are hopefully going to get what they voted for, which is real change. We, we just saw a picture come across um, uh, the, the, the Twitter feed. Uh, and there's a lot of people in this selfie. You apparently were one of them. <laughs> Yeah, I'm somewhere in there. I guess they used a... By the way, I hate selfie sticks, uh, so, but they used a selfie stick to take it, so, so I begrudgingly accepted. Just, just but to I think be I'm clear, in the, way back. the vice president-elect, Mike Pence, used a selfie stick. I don't know if he used it. I couldn't see what the throngs of crowd is in front of me. Somebody used it, but he was in a picture with a selfie stick, and I used to protest that, but I'll take it on this time. Oh, thank you for your time today. No, it's a big day for your family. Your grandmother turns 95. Yes, wow. happy birthday, Grandma. Happy 95th birthday. It's a life well lived. Thank you, sir. You bet. Good stuff. All right, let's go back there because that's where a lot of the action is today. And our senior Capitol Hill producer, Chad Pergram, is standing by with more. Chad, over to you. So just a couple of moments ago, uh, Vice President-elect Pence came to Capitol Hill. He walked right in this door behind me. He met with House Republicans for about 45 minutes. You have to remember that it wasn't that long ago that Mike Pence was the type of person who led that meeting. He was the chairman of the House Republican Conference. He led these meetings, brought similar figures to Capitol Hill for those. And so this was a bit of a homecoming. Uh, he was uh, uh, reacted that he was happy to be back here on Capitol Hill. And remember, there were a lot of Republicans in Congress who were skeptical about the Donald Trump ticket. One of the reasons they were willing to get on board was because they trust Mike Pence. I'm told a lot of the conversation focused on faith-related issues. They talked about a religious provision in a defense bill. They also uh, thanked him for his uh, pro-life stance. Pence said he was only going to uh, take about four or five questions here, but he talked for 45 minutes. He is going to meet later in the day with the House Speaker Paul Ryan. He also has a couple of Democratic meetings. He's going to go meet with uh, Nancy Pelosi the minority leader, and then go over to the Senate side and meet with Chuck Schumer. Uh, going back to the meeting here, he stopped just by the, the cameras a couple of moments ago here, and, and here's a couple of things he said. He said, we are confident, we are working in concert with members of Congress here on Capitol Hill. He says, we're going to rebuild our military, and in a word, make America great again. All right. Chad, thank you very much. Interesting to watch uh, all of this unfold. You saw Mike Pence's daughter, Kelly, there with him. Uh, it's just an extraordinary moment for them as they return, as he is about to become vice president. Big agenda, but they've got to get the Democrats on board, at least to some extent, to get some of this through um, without a filibuster. So that's the work that he's got cut out it, for it him. It appears, you know, right now, just looking at some of the headlines coming out of Capitol Hill, that they, uh, Republicans in Congress could get a three-month extension, perhaps, on you know, some sort of budget deal that, that pushes pushes it back maybe to, to March that would give the incoming team 60 days. Okay maybe 80 days to perhaps outline its own um, economic agenda. So just be on the lookout for that today. May happen. So a U.S. city approving a lesson plan, calling the next president a racist. We'll tell you what that's all about and where that's happening in a moment. And students across the country still protesting the election. What these activists are hoping to achieve. 
I'm here at this protest because there's been a lot of groups that have been hurt by some of the rhetoric of Donald Trump, and since now he's elected into um, the presidency, a lot of us are standing up and saying, um, you know, he has to be held accountable for the words that he has said. So here's another breaking story. I want to take you overseas in Berlin. President Obama now on the second leg of his final overseas trip as president. Meeting today with German Chancellor Angela Merkel and expected to hold a press conference. You're going to see that in about 20 minutes from now. Uh, he arrives in Germany after his visit in Greece, where he strongly defended globalization and warned of threats to modern democracy. Those comments got some attention. Kevin Cork live in Berlin now, the sixth time the president has been in Germany. And what's behind the final stop there in Europe? Kevin? Well, I got to tell you, Bill, listen, it's all about optics, right? The president wants to be the very embodiment of the notion that uh, the relationship that is just so special and long standing between the U.S. and Germany and U.S. and Europe in general uh, will not change under a Trump presidency. And that's crucial. But I also, in particular, want to point your attention to the special relationship between the U.S. and Germany. Keep in mind, Angela Merkel, the chancellor here, uh, has a very very close relationship with the president. She has been, without doubt, his closest confidant. Uh, they have worked through so many uh, different things here together. Uh, I mean, I could go down the list. They've had major economic and trade crises. They've battled the scourge of terrorism. Uh, they've also attempted to navigate the very thorny issues uh, in the Middle East, including the massive refugee migration which has been a, a huge game changer, not just on the continent, but in particular here in Germany. And so the, what the president is hoping to do is not just reassure Angela Merkel, but all the leaders in Europe. Keep in mind on Friday, he'll be meeting with the other Eurozone leaders. And the, the message is simple, Bill. He wants to make sure they know that despite the change in leadership back home, he's doing all he can to not only make sure that Europe is in a very strong position moving forward, but the same applies for the U.S. Here's his press secretary, Josh Ernest, on that. President Obama certainly dedicated a significant portion of his presidency to making sure that that relationship was deepened, that that relationship was strengthened uh, in a way that had enormous and significant uh, national security and economic benefits for the American people. And uh, there certainly is a tradition of presidents in both parties uh, choosing to pursue that. But ultimately, President-elect Trump will have to determine what sort of path he wants to chart from here. So you see what Josh is really getting at there, Bill, and that is the president feels like he has a very strong relationship. He's counting on their candor in particular as he tries to lay the foundation for the Trump administration, which will be on the job before you know it. Watch it. Bill? We're watching. Thank you. Kevin Cork live there in Berlin. More coming up on that top of the hour. Protests erupting across the country following Donald Trump's victory. Many demonstrations taking place on college campuses, including this one that was at Rutgers University in New Jersey. But it's not just students who are participating in all of this. A number of leaders of sanctuary cities say that they will ignore any deportation order. Many of them saying that they will not work with the feds to deport undocumented immigrants. Leslie Marshall is syndicated radio talk show host and a Fox News contributor. Steve Hilton is founder and CEO of Crowd pack and a former strategy director for UK Prime Minister David Cameron. Welcome uh, to both of you. I, I think one of the big issues here is good morning is is understanding what the actual policy will be um, because the administration so far that's coming into leadership here has said that what they're first going to do is, is lock down the border and then comes finding people who are criminals um, who have committed crimes in this country or have been kicked out and come back as we saw in the Kate Stanley case and make sure that they're they're gone before any sort of you know removal of other people would happen is that your understanding Steve um, I think that's exactly right. I think the, the, the focus of the policy is on exactly what was set out in the campaign and seems perfectly reasonable. And the core principles of that, that a country should be able to control its borders, decides who comes here, make sure that people who've broken the law um, aren't allowed to stay here. That, I don't think there's, there's anything unreasonable about any of that. And the thing I'd really say about the mayors around the country who are saying they're going to defy anything that might happen is this. Look, I'm a real believer in local government and decentralization. I think that in, in many ways our government is too centralized. But there are certain policies that just have to be carried out at a national level. And immigration is one of them. You just can't have a patchwork of different immigration policies mm -hmm. around the country. It doesn't make sense. You know, I just want to play this exchange with Tucker Carlson last night. He spoke with one of the Rutgers students on his show, and here's what happened. Watch. Do you think people right. have a right to lock their doors? 
Or do you think they have an obligation to let anyone uh, in sure who chooses your... to come? Well, you're saying that the United States has no right to prevent people who want to come here from coming here. And I'm just asking you, does the same apply to us as individuals? Do you have a right to keep people out who want to share your apartment with you? I think, um, I think that's not really a direct analogy. Um, that obviously a, a, a nation state, um, a right. sovereign nation state is very different from an individual. Well, I was trying to make the point that, you know, every nation has to have a border. And I think when you look at it, you know, in that way, Leslie, um, most people accept that. Well, first of all, there's a very big difference between a border, a well-patrolled border, and a walled-off border, which it won't be. I mean, I was listening to interviews today. They're talking about one to 200 miles of possible additional fencing, and we know the fencing just a couple of hours south of where I'm sitting uh, is not necessarily working. And the drug cartels have uh, uh, miles and miles of tunnels underground, and yeah. we saw people go over the Berlin Wall, for crying out loud. Uh, so I, I understand the analogy. Um, I love Tucker, and I do lock my doors, uh, but I do understand uh, not just the anger, but the fear among these students. I, I live in a city where we have, and I live in a state, where we have the largest Latino population, the largest undocumented population, the largest Muslim population, and uh, a lot of these kids are not just exercising their First Amendment right, but they're fearful of what the future holds based on some of the rhetoric and some of the policies they fear are coming uh, in the next four years. Do you, uh, do you think they're reasonable to assume that they're going to be kicked out of their homes? Here in Southern California, we have to remember in some of the Latino community, uh, there are uh, mixes of undocumented and legalized born here citizens uh, at one family table on a nightly basis. Yep. So there are some kids in school that fear that daddy will be deported even though mommy's a citizen and they were born here, or that their grandparents will be deported, that their families will be torn apart. They're also concerned about the racism. We've seen a lot of hateful attacks, unfortunately, since the election. But I, I think, and I think know, a lot of people are waiting. But there needs to be a focus on, on exactly you know what, what the laws are in the country that exist. And there's so many people who come here, immigrants, first gener generation immigrants who come here legally who you know sort of spend money they don't have to you know get through the process who get who leave and come back you know according to the rules and so why would it be that they have to be subject to a different set of rules than people who run across the border Steve I, I, I don't think they should and I think that the other point we've got to bear in mind here is that because of what I consider to be the essential reasonableness of the actual policies what you're seeing in the response, which I agree with Leslie, it is very sincerely felt. I don't think we should dismiss it Agreed. as being insincere. But the, but the trouble is, it's not a response to the actual policies. It's actually a response to the propaganda that was created during the campaign, where, where the, those on the left built up Trump to be such a cartoonish monster that people now believe these things, which don't really bear any relation to the policy proposals he was yeah. making in the campaign or is making now. Yeah, I mean, I think the actions will speak the loudest and it is incumbent upon the new administration to follow through with the policy that they put down and uh, and see it through but I think that everybody you know sort of needs to take a deep breath and see how that plays out thank you very much both Thanks, of you Martha. for being here today good thank to see you. you guess what we've got we now have a camera inside the lobby the Trump Tower so folks this is what you're going to see very soon for the next what would you think Two weeks? At least a couple of weeks. Four yeah. weeks, right? The comings and goings. And the comings and goings. And there's a big list of them today, <laughs> including uh, the Japanese Prime Minister. Do you think we should afternoon. run over there and just run in front of the cameras, <laughs> just demonstrate how it works I don't for think, people? I don't think they'd let us in. <laughs> uh, so Mr. Trump has a series of meetings yet again today, much like yesterday. And so we're going yeah. to see this, this flow go in and out uh, for some time now. And Kellyanne Conway led our show earlier today, and we were asking about the transition process and some of the reporting that suggests it's a Game of Thrones inside there or that it's a nice fight and she Apprentice wanted dislike perhaps she wanted to assure everybody that the transition process and the schedule is on track that was her message yeah she was talking about the fact that you know you have to take your time that other presidents have taken their time uh, most of them have not really done any of these decisions until at least a couple of weeks in so Donald Trump has already made two of those big decisions and it looks like they are getting close on some of these others uh, as they watch people come in and out Rudy Giuliani was one of those who came in earlier this morning uh, we saw Sean Spicer who we've talked to as a communications director of the RNC also coming in and out so um, it's pretty fascinating actually to be to have a camera to watch the the, the uh, ongoing 
ongoing process. Yeah, and there is news, too. The, you know, the landing teams that they mentioned last right. night that will interact with the federal government, the federal agencies, I should say, that in Washington. Uh, that includes State Department, Justice Department, Defense Department. So that's the approach the Trump team is now taking, and this process has been launched. So. Can you imagine the excitement at these agencies? The landing team is here. <laughs> oh, oh. <laughs> very interesting. Drain the swamp uh, underway. We'll see. We'll be right back. So from the city of San Francisco, it's approved a school lesson plan branding our next president a sexist and racist. The city's Republican Party understandably outraged at that. And William Lajeunesse follows up. He's live in L.A. In California, William, what's happening? Well, Bill, we all know that teachers can have a very positive influence on students. Well, I want you to meet one who is shaping minds in San Francisco, where the teachers' union 